and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us from Brambleheart Games the developer of Fey Earth, which we'll be returning to once once again for, for this, for the first time in about two years, Mr. Neil Byrne. How are you doing today, man? How's it going? Great to be back. As my chiropractor often says, glad to see you're back. Mm -hmm. I won't make the don't call me John joke because I did that last time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I'm, I'm still disappointed that, that so few people make that joke. Oh, well. Well, it has been it has been quite a while. Um, mm -hmm. I did I did take a look at the Explorer's Guide to Fey Earth that you have on um, Itch, and mm -hmm. since it's been it's been a couple of years, I, I um, congratulations on the work you've been doing with actual plays when it comes to the game. Oh. Yeah, thanks. That's been fun. Um, because like I'd all I'd had the podcast when we when last we were talking, I was um I was putting out our weekly game as a podcast. Mm -hmm. But January of last year, we moved to Twitch, mm -hmm. so streaming every Tuesday. So that was a whole other level of complexity. Um, having never done anything like that before, mm -hmm. um, pretty challenging at first, mostly because of um issues with my broadband internet service provider but eventually the tech gremlins were dealt with and it's been a lot of fun mm -hmm. uh, and, and a, a lot of fun with a, a small but like consistent you know community of fans mm -hmm. and in the t in the time that you've done the actual plays whether it, whether it be in its form from a couple of years ago or the twitch version of it um what would you say have been some of the big takeaways you've had in developing um, Fey Earth, or just things that you didn't originally account for that cropped up during play? Well, when I our first campaign, so I mean, I've been working on this game for seven years now, all right? And then when, when I first started writing and developing the system, after about maybe four or five months, when I felt like I had enough of the mechanics written that i could run a game i then went to my friends and said i want to run a regular game to play test this system you know and that was campaign one that ran for about five years when we first started playing we were playing once a fortnight and then it moved to weekly and then COVID happened so you know we probably could have gotten it done a bit quicker but you know still but that campaign ran from levels one to twenty so like the system has been extensively play tested all the way through to the top epic tier levels, which is kind of funny considering that only something like 5% of gamers ever play characters at those levels. But nonetheless, um, when I was first developing it and the original playtest campaign, it was, or the original campaign was, was, was largely born off of me playtesting the system. And there were changes that I made to the rules in the game as we were playing. By the time we'd been playing a couple of years, it was very much cemented in place. Campaign 2, which we started last January on Twitch, um, is set 30 years into the future. So the camp first campaign was set in the 1840s in Ireland, mm -hmm. though in alternate Ireland because the history of Fey Earth has changed um, slightly in some ways, but significantly in others. Um, but Campaign 2, set in the year 1872 in France, um, and what really ha I've been able to develop is more of the actual... The lore of the world itself, because um, in Campaign 2, it's set about six months after the Franco-Prussian War. However, the Franco-Prussian War in Fey Earth is not the same Franco-Prussian War that we had in our history, which was a war between uh, Bismarck's Prussia and Napoleon III's France. Rather, in Fey Earth, there's the Kingdom of Arcadia, one of the two Fey nations of Europe, which is nestled between Germany and France. Um, it makes up what would be the Alsace region of France with the city of Strasbourg, the Black Forest region of Germany, about half of Switzerland and the Austrian Alps. And in the setting, um, the king of Arcadia, the elven king of Arcadia, died. Now, he'd been ruler for like seven, eight hundred years. So, like, shockwaves across Europe that the the ruler of the most powerful nation 
in Europe was now dead. And um, Bismarck saw this as a possible sign that the Fey were vulnerable, so goes and talks to Napoleon, who he hates and who hates him, but the people they hate more are the Fey, owning all of that land between them, and they decide, let's ally ourselves and attack Arcadia. And there was a devastating war. At first, the humans were actually doing okay, better than they had, like, ever in the history of human Fey conflict, um, because of... The fact that they're using modern 19th century weapons, you we have like it's 1872, so we have modern rifles and rifling technology. Guns are a lot more powerful, a lot more accurate. Artillery is a lot more powerful and a lot more accurate. So at the early stages of the war, they're actually inflicting casualties on the Fey, which had never happened before. But then the Fey adapted their tactics and ended with a devastating attack that wiped out most of the. Um, French and Prussian armies and so the, the, the this campaign is set six months after the end of that war in a France that is recovering from having had this pretty devastating war so what I've really been able to do with um, true playing in this campaign is really develop the world itself a lot more whereas my previous focus was on the mechanics of the system now I'm getting more into the actual world building and how the cultures and societies of the world of fey earth are different to what we think of when we think of the 19th century yeah i mean the the technology as i understand it the technology level is relatively similar just with the monkey wrench of the presence of the supernatural more, more prevalent obviously mm -hmm. but a lot of the a lot of the firearm technology is still re is still relatively there um, uh huh. Oh, the co the concept of the Mad Minute is pro is probably still a, still a relatively used tactic. Mm -hmm. uh, and for for those who are unaware of the Mad Minute, that was the that was the tactic that was used in I think the fir I think the First World War was it was used at at its height of being able to f ha being able to fire just a large amount a large volley of shots in the span of a minute. Which yeah sounds sounds passe nowadays, but it's important to remember getting getting more than like five shots in the span in the span of a minute was something that took a lot of skill. Well, I mean, at the time of um, Napoleon the First and his Grand Armée, or even um, the United States with their Civil War, when you were still using front-loading musket rifles, the best, most highly trained soldiers were getting off five shots in a minute, or sorry, three shots in a minute. Yeah. you know, but. The di oh, like, like I know very little about firearms. My expertise when it comes to weapons is historical weapons. I have 20 years of fencing experience under my belt, um, including historical European martial arts, which I've been doing for a long time. Um, so I know virtually nothing about firearms. But when I started writing Fair Earth, obviously I had to start researching firearms. And when I did, I was horrified and terrified to see the massive leaps in firearms technology in a really short period of time when you look at what guns could do in 1830 versus 1860 it's terrifying oh yeah because of the introduction of um board rifling technology mm -hmm. and the changes in how ammunition was being constructed it's terrifying you know so you go from a good experienced soldier is getting off three shots in a minute to I have a rifle that's accurate to over a hundred meters and it has a cartridge of eight to ten bullets in it. Yeah. Um although although there were there were some there were some firearms that even even when they came out were outdated. I keep, I even though some people romanticize it, I keep making fun of the Mauser broom handle. Because mm -hmm. in in nineteen thirteen it was still using stripper clips. <laughs> You know, instead, in when people were starting to move towards you towards using what would what would be the the fir the first steps towards using magazines. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, well, but we have to remember what, what they always say that um, the um, the commanders and generals in charge of armies mm -hmm. have always perfected their tactics for the previous war. Pre pretty much. Yeah, and you do really see that, I would say, even up to today. 
like let's be honest you know even in modern conflicts we see it today i mean you just have have to look at the horrors that are happening in ukraine right now but how russia has been completely devastated by the ukrainian use of drone technology it's both the drones and oddly enough not learning from history yeah because they forget they forgot about the spring rains problem in that part of um, europe I know, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so yeah, so uh, going back to the uh, the original question though, that's been the big difference. Um, like there were other mechanical differences. So when last I was talking to you, I had I think it was six playable classes in the game, mm -hmm. but I added a seventh, the witch, which I'm very very proud of. Mm -hmm. Um, because this is a class that has unique spells that are only available to the witches, though they do have access to all the spells of the other spellcasting classes. But another ability that they have is they make these amulets, minor and major amulets that they get, and they can make more of as they go up in level. And as the witch increases in level, the amulet that they make increases in power. But what I really love about this class and why I'm so proud of it is the fact that all of the spells unique to the witch class and the amulets that are unique to them are based on historical examples of European folk magic. I did like 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 every other aspect of my game. Um, I have done thousands of hours of research on folklore relating to fairies and fae and magical creatures. I also did extensive research on European folk magic. This is something I already knew a bit about, but I went into it in a lot more detail, a lot more depth. So the witches. Um, ritual spells, as they're called in the game. These are the spells you need to, which is they're the only spells in the game that require material components. But the material components are extremely specific because they are based on actual examples of spells and charms that have survived, that were recorded, um, that were recorded in history that were either in writings, where maybe recorded in accounts of witch trials, um, in books, um, necromantic manuals, and other magical tomes from the Middle Ages, or in the example of some of the charms and amulets, survived and are in museums um, that survived in the archaeological record. So yeah. that's one of the big differences. So they're a wonderful class to play. Honestly, I can confidently and proudly say I have never seen this in any other game that I am aware of. A witch class based on actual examples of European folk magic. And speaking of that research, within the full book, do you plan on putting in an appendix that re that references some of the stuff that you had um, used as re as research if somebody wants I to lead into that? I'll I'll probably be more of a recommended reading this because the research that I've done has been a combination of books that are collections of fairy tales, mm -hmm. um, so such as um, the Brothers Grimm from Germany, Madame Dobry from France, um, Calvino Italiano for Italy, and so forth. But then a lot of my research has also been academic texts um, written by academic folklorists or academic papers written by folklorists. Um, so as a consequence, um, I don't think it would be really useful to the average player to have those kinds of references in the book because like I pay a, I pay an annual subscription to an academic, um, an academic journal's website to get access to academic papers mm -hmm. that I have been using in my research. This was a personal financial investment by me, so I had better access to the materials I needed in my research. So there's no point in me like referencing a specific article, you know, for that I used when I was developing dragons or when I was like trying to get my head around the difference between a hobgoblin and a cobalt. But I couldn't but I can of course reference um certain more mainstream books which i found to be very useful um which definitely would be in a recommended reading list for people who would like to learn a bit more about um folklore and not just fairy tales but like the original versions of the fairy tales you know like going back to brothers Grimm, like they're a really interesting example i think there were i think they published six editions of their books um because I can't remember which, I think it was Wilhelm. He was the more devout Lutheran of the two, and he would he changed the actual stories in the books to essentially 
create moral messages and teachings for kids influenced by his Lutheran Christian belief systems. So the first edition of their book is the essentially it's the true faithful original versions of the stories that had been told in german speaking regions for hundreds of years but by the time you get to the fifth or sixth version of the book you can see where he had made in some cases significant changes to the stories so they would fit into a more christian moral viewpoint mm -hmm. so this is the kind of stuff that i can recommend to people who are interested in this although i will go so far as to say that unfortunately and this was the first thing i discovered in my research is that it can be very hard to find really good source material for this because unfortunately um it's a very sad thing to say but um much of europe lost its folklore i, I mean i'm irish mm -hmm. <laughs> ireland has some of the greatest folklore certainly in europe if not in the world um we have a rich and ancient folklore that was extremely well preserved as do the Scots, the Welsh, the Nordics, and the Slavs as well, the Slavic countries too. Incredibly rich ancient folklore that was really well preserved by their people. But then when you go across much of the rest of Europe, Germany, France, Spain, unless you had individuals, historical figures like the Brothers Grimm, who, who actively decided to go around and collect these stories, in many cases the stories were lost and it can be very hard to find. Mm -hmm. And... Of and of course, mud muddying the waters have have been some of the um, hipsters over the centuries who were, who thought that they were some who thought that they were some sort of neo pagan or or something that just muddies everything up. Where oh yeah, between between that and the Christians as well, like you get both sides of the coin. You know, you can see where um, um, the church and Christian communities were changing things. Um, like we see this in Ireland, for example, that um, all of the myths, the ancient myths of our country were written down by Christian monks, mostly in the 12th and 13th century. And you can clearly see where they have deliberately made changes to the original stories to insert a Christian message into it, you know. Um, so you have that in the earlier um, Middle Ages, but then you got those wacko Victorians going around in bedsheets calling themselves Druids in the late 19th century as well. So you kind of get two ends of the spectrum when it comes to this. And that that of co that of course makes things all the more um, all the more tricky when when trying to do research on this kind of thing of parsing parsing the the actual subject matter from mm. pe from people's interpret from people's interpretations of what they think the subject matter is. Mm, yeah, that's why, in as much as I can, I've always tried to go with a translation of a primary source where mm -hmm. possible, you know, a translation of a story as it would have been written, um, yeah. either through, like, what I get from academic folklorists, there's some Patreons that I follow as well who are folklorists too, but like, as I said, I've been developing this game for seven years most people do not take seven years to develop a TTRPG but most people aren't nut jobs like me trying to make something that authentically portrays hundreds of years of folklore. And let, let's be honest, every game designer has a bit of um, masochism in them. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> oh, and it, it's the I have this. I have said the same thing about anybody who GMs. Every GM yes. is a masochist. They just don't want to admit it. Mm -hmm. Well, some some of them do, and those are usually the fun ones. Yeah. <laughs> at least they're at. I mean, yeah, yeah, they're probably going to put you in some TBK situation, but at least they're honest about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but now you had you had said that you had added a seventh class, so I'd like to go. I'd like to go into the classes a bit. Are they yeah, sure. mostly un, are they mostly unchanged from when I spoke with you a couple years ago? Yeah, or um, are there some significant tweaks that have happened? Not major tweaks. It's mostly been subtle stuff like adding some extra skills and other features like that and maybe some minor changes to try and make them more balanced, but they are still largely the same. So you've got your fighter class who are your mar your martial class and um, they are they get um, what makes them good is that they get uh, free levels of XP like training in like fighting skills and combat feats, which is one of my special mechanics that I have. It's um, feats being special moves that you can train in to augment your major actions um, in and out of combat. Mm -hmm. And um, and then you got the gunslingers, 
who have their unique skills like sharpshooter, quick shot, that kind of stuff. The rogues I did do a little bit more work on. I feel they're a bit more developed than they were, but um even when I was talking to two years ago, it was still they were the only uh, class that had the archetypes. You've got um the effectively an arcane trickster type character called um a shadow caster who have access to, uh, from seventh level, gain access to spells from the spheres of charm or twilight, um so that's illusions and enchantments. Or you've got what I call the enhanced trainer, where you basically just get a shit ton of extra levels of training and skills, so you can become really, really good at a lot of stuff. Um, so there were some subtle changes that I made with them, just to get, make them a bit more balanced in combat, because um, in earlier iterations of that of that class, they were a really good skill-based class, but at times they felt a bit underpowered in combat. So... You know, but that's the glory of, you know, playtesting is that you get to balance these things out. Um, but then the other the other class is the witch, or sorry, not the witch, the mystic, the druid, and the sorcerer. They um, they largely remain the same. I think the only thing I added in was um, I added an animal companion for the druid because the sorcerer already had the ability, if you find a fairy dragon, a pseudo dragon, you can the sorcerers can take them as familiars. Mm-hmm. And um, the witch class... They can also take a familiar in the form of a raven, a toad, a cat, a rat, that kind of thing. So I thought, oh, well, I'll give the Edruids an animal companion too, because it seems like it would make sense, and it also helps balance things, you know. So, so yeah, so they m- mostly kind of like refining things to create better balance between the classes. Yeah, and I've sometimes talked about how certain bi- how certain builds designers didn't... Um... Th- didn't account didn't account for, but ended ended up um, accidenting them themselves into it. Um, were there any cases of of that where somebody um, came came up with a really effective approach by accident by accident? Um, the closest I can think of is um, some certain rather interesting interpretations of spells based on the literal phrasing of the words, but I then amended the spell descriptions. So I remember in our first campaign, I had a, two spells, Lesser Blink and Greater Blink. Your classic Blink spell, the difference being Lesser Blink is random, the direction and distance you travel in, whereas Greater Blink, you can choose a spot within 10 meters of you. And um, one of my players who had that spell started using in combat to make our enemies blink, disappearing and reappearing 10 meters in the air and drop 10 meters and take significant fall damage, Um, which was very much breaking the spell. That's not what the spell is supposed to do. But because I hadn't explicitly stated appears at a point on the ground, they were like, well, you didn't say you said 10 meters and this is still within 10 meters. So I started doing that back to the players, and we all agreed that that was fair, because um, fall damage in my game is, yeah, none of this 1d6 per 5 feet bullshit, no, is proper. Um, But I then reworded the spell and amended for that. So it was mostly that kind of stuff where I was like, yeah, this is not the way this was supposed to be done. When it came to, like, core class abilities, I'm actually quite proud to say that I've not found any significant examples of an ability that has inadvertently become broken. Um, There are certain abilities that can be very powerful in certain situations, but when I wrote those abilities, I knew that that was going to be the case, so I'm still happy to keep them in. Um, But, you know, the spells, they did require a bit of refining. Yeah, which definitely makes sense. There's a lot of moving parts to deal with in those kind of situations, and... Mm. When you have that many moving parts, you're inevitably going to deal with some that don't that um don't quite that don't quite match up or match up a little too well. Um, fight fighting games have this problem all, all the time. You end up having one or two characters who just trounce everybody to the point of getting banned. <laughs> mm. Well, actually, I've got to say that's one area, one way in which I feel that Fey Earth is maybe superior is the wrong word, but is okay superior screw it to other games in that (laughs) that that doesn't tend to be the case um and that's partially because all of the classes come with skills and abilities that make them really good not at everything but at certain things um but also there's such a wide range of of adversaries you can throw at the players because these creatures are different creatures from folklore 
So you can have a creature that's incredibly physically strong, like an ogre or a troll or some type of giant. But you can also have characters that are incredibly cunning, like your goblins, and extremely magically powerful, like even just a simple fairy. So as a consequence of that, a character that might have done really well in one scenario because of their skills might suddenly find in another scenario they're completely screwed. But a, but, 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 but a different party member is now stepping up to the front and they are like MVP of that session. That certainly makes sense, and even with even within that, the the attitude that the attitude that I've always gotten from this is that even though you're using the D twenty as your core resolution mechanic, um, somebody somebody couldn't go into this from a lot of a lot of the more common D twenty based systems and and, and um just go a one just do a one to one they'd ha there'd be things that they'd have to adjust to have you had any instances where some had an easier or harder time adjusting to the quirks of fey earth compared to what they came in with so the big thing like the first thing i'll say is again again this is a d20 system so like, if you've played any d20 system if you played 5e pathfinder literally any d20 system you will pick up the rules of this game within five minutes it, this is an incredibly well designed and very simple system and I can say this because my day job, I teach maths in secondary school to teenagers, okay? So every day I'm working with teenagers who struggle with maths and numeracy, which is why I'm very good at spotting where the problems are in other systems. It's one of the reasons why I have issues with 5e, because I feel it's a unnecessarily complicated game mechanic, you know? So when I designed Fey Earth, I wanted to design a system that was going to be very simple, very easy, and very streamlined for anybody to play it. So that's so from that perspective, you could immediately come from another D20 system and straight away know what you're doing in Fey Earth. But I have had definitely situations with like I did have like with a player who um kept forgetting that they weren't playing D and D. And they were trying to do stuff that just didn't work because this wasn't D and D. Um you know, certain spells that might be pretty standard there don't exist in my game, or just the kind of stuff that they were doing didn't work because of the subtle differences in how action economy in my game works. So the big difference being that in Fey Earth, you get three actions in a turn, your major action and two minor actions, and your major action is your action action, you know, attack, cast a spell, that kind of stuff. But then the minor actions is for everything from moving to reloading a firearm to sheathing a weapon and drawing a weapon to also reactions you know and and also using the feet mechanics that exist in my system so you have an awful lot more freedom and choice in what you can do in a turn in fair than in other systems because of the way the action economy works and i did find certainly I had one player who kept forgetting like they kept treating it like this is fifth edition and um at times they were really struggling because they try and do something and it's like i'm sitting there saying that's not going to work and the other players look at that and i'm going what are you trying to do that's not going to work and um and then it wouldn't work but um they'd figure out so, uh something better to do but it's like you know so so from that perspective it's just kind of like a difference in mindset i think but largely because there is so much more freedom and scope and what you can do as a player, it's not that you're going to become overloaded with um, what's it, um, and choice and action or anything like that, you know. But just that you, 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 you'll want to have to think a bit more creatively. Yeah, analysis paralysis is the yeah, term I yeah, that's use the word. Yeah, um, and that, and that's some, that's something that can fe a lot of times analysis paralysis shows up mostly in character creation, and in this case, that's not as um, present. It's one that can happen in the moment to moment with the mm -hmm. um, scope of actions that's present here. Now, mm -hmm. earlier you had talked you had talked about epic rules, which mm -hmm. is interesting to me because unless unless there's been an update that I'm not that I'm not aware of, most of the most of the professions that you have in Fey Earth cap at level ten. Oh no, that's so no no. They are, that's just in the the Explorer's Guide to Fey Earth, which is the freely available version that's on our itch.io, goes to level ten. 
but that's because it's a free early release version of the game. Oh. The final core rulebook, when it is released, will go up to twentieth level. All right. Yeah. So that's what that. So that's that's why that is like. Um, that was a desi- that was a choice for me as a designer and creator because obviously I want to sharing your content with people will generate more interest. But it's like, well, I don't want to just give the game away for free. I want people to ultimately want to buy my game, and so like the balancing for me was, I know I'll release pretty much all the rules as they are, um, but only give you what you need to get to tenth level. Um, and I felt that was kind of a fair balancing to do, especially when you consider that for most people playing a, a regular game with their friends, most people rarely get past twelfth level anyway. You know. Like that's just the facts. Um, so that's but um, like the Kickstarter, it's going well. Um, I'd like it to be going better, of course, but it is going well. We've already we've hit thirty percent within the first week, which is a hell of a lot better than the first time round. And I am confident that we are going to get the full f- um, funding goal of the Kickstarter. I don't think we're going to get much more than that, hitting stretch goals, but. I am confident that this Kickstarter is going to succeed. Obviously, any support from your listeners is greatly appreciated. But when the Kickstarter is successful and we get the funds we need to publish the game, the final core rulebook, the final version of the game, will be a standard levels 1 to 20 system. Mm-hmm. And are there, when it comes to that, dif- that difference, when you're dealing with mm-hmm. the levels in the, t- in the teens... Mm-hmm. Is the, is there a is there a significant di- difference to the kit of the of the various classes in terms of what they're able to do? Um, yes and no. Um, like in that at the higher levels, you're getting largely just better at what you were good at anyway. Um, to an extent, like when you say so, for example, with the um with the druids. Um, one of the things that they get is that at higher levels they can start traveling within the Fey Realm as if they are true Fey. So the Fey Realm and the land that the Fey are believed to have come from, um, it's a place, there are portals to the Fey Realm all across the world. They are mainly found in places like the old ancient megalithic sites that dot across Europe or places of intense natural beauty. Humans generally stay away from them because anytime you hear a story of somebody being taken away by the fairies, when they come back, they'll think that only a couple of weeks has passed, but it might have been a century or more, and they literally will age 100 years in front of the people they're talking to and turn to bone and ash. Um, so j- staying away from the Fey Realm is a good idea, but a high-level druid can travel the Fey Realm as if they're true Fey, meaning that they are completely immune to the weird w- timey wimey dilation effects of the Fey Realm, and then also gaining other abilities like being better able to do things like their B-shape abilities and even being able to cast spells in their animal form, you know? Mm-hmm. And the gunslingers at higher levels just become ridiculously good with their guns. I mean, to put it into context, in our first campaign, my wife was playing a gunslinger character and by 20th level, actually... So, sorry about that. I think I think um, this I think Discord had messed with me for a second. Oh, okay. Uh, no worries. But yes, yeah, so, so like that's the kind of stuff you see. Like, um, as I say, the high level gunslinger plus fourteen, plus sixteen, plus eighteen to hit, plus twelve, plus fourteen to damage die, attacking maybe up to five times in a turn, or using special call shots that can like completely disable, stun, drop players. You know, um. And then, like at the at like a twentieth level, like you get like these like the twentieth level mystic, which is the cleric class of the game. They get a thing called celestial mantle. Once per day, you transform into a celestial visage of your mystic part. Path of wings sprout from your shoulders. You gain a flying speed of fifteen and give off an aura of a radius equal to your charm, which does one d twelve points of damage. And you, like, temporary grip, like, you know, that kind of stuff, like, you know, so you get really, really cool. And that was one thing, actually, I felt I was very proud of as a GM um, with our first campaign was that my players got to 20th level. And then we had the final fight against the BPEG, which was a which was a group of cultists trying to free an ancient 
evil fae that was trying to be rule the world like a like a god mm-hmm. and um so like because quite commonly when if people do get to 20th level they f- they they kill vecna or tiamat or you know whatever the bbeg is mm-hmm. and then it's like you got to 20th level and your character never tires and you never got to do any of the cool shit that you got at 20th level whereas when we played our when we played our, our first campaign i made sure that my players got to 20th level nearly died getting there and then we had the final battle where they were now 20th level characters with all those crazy abilities, which was a lot of fun. And then um, came really close. Like they were two rounds from the dark ancient Fae being released. And if he had, then they would have been fighting effectively a demigod, mm-hmm. having already crossed an entire literal battlefield and being pretty tapped out by that point. Yeah. But they managed to win the day. So yeah, those those kinds of like as I say, fun things that like you know, you spent all this time building up your character and giving them abilities based on the class and on their background and on the type of person they are. So you want your epic tier abilities to 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 be in keeping with that flavor, and that's what I've tried to do. Yeah. I I can certainly get that. Um mm-hmm. now give, given how some of the f- um, different feats had minimum levels and had different costs. Are there mm. going to be the equivalent of, for lack of a better term, epic feats that you have pla- that you have planned for those higher levels? Well, no, not really, because well, I mean, some of the some of the top level feats you don't you don't get access to in like twelfth or fourteenth level. Mm-hmm. But the thing, the way the feat mechanic works, where the more powerful the feat, the more it costs you, and the way the feat mechanic works is you've got to beat the target number by the feat cost. So if I'm trying to hit something and I want to use a really powerful combat feat and it has a, say, a defense of 16 and the combat feat has a cost of 6, then I need my final roll to be 22 or higher, you know? Um, So the way the maths of my system works is um, I, it's at higher levels, the higher feat, the more powerful feats cost more but at those levels, your modifiers for things like attacking are significantly higher anyway. So the game has been designed in such a way that at very high levels, extremely powerful feats that should cost a lot and be difficult to, to perform, actually most of the time you will successfully succeed in being able to do. So I chose that instead of having these special extra cool epic feats that you're only getting at the high levels instead made a system whereby no the stuff that you've done you become much better because the whole point of the feat mechanic in my game was the idea of the hero in the myth or legend who had the signature cool special move that they did in, in combat and i wanted to create a mechanic where players could give their characters these cool special moves so I've done that and design it in such a way that by the time you get to the top tier levels, you're pulling off these special moves pretty much whenever you want, as opposed to at the lower levels when, yeah, it works if you roll well. Yeah, I can I can certainly get behind that. Now, with that with that in mind, uh, I know that there's been I know that there's been a few. A few one, sh- a few one shot adventures. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, att- on the on your itch page. Do you have any plans on do on presenting like a a a micro campaign or in the full book, or do you plan on just putting in a um a a, sim- a simple one shot like you've done like you've done in the past? So in the core rule book itself, I'll probably, I will be having a one shot. But in terms of just get this is a great chance to talk about the tiers of the Kickstarter. And there's three main tiers in my Kickstarter. At the 20 euro tier, you get a digital PDF version of the core rule book. So that's everything you need to play this game. It's a single book. You're not having to buy a player's handbook and a GM's guide or anything. No, no, it's a single book. Most of the book is the rules of the system, your player's handbook, and then chapters on the actual setting itself. 
and then there's a section which is the GM's guide with rules and suggestions and tips for your GMs, and then the final third or so of the game is the zoological compendium with the stat blocks of the various fake creatures, okay? And they will put in a simple, short, um, effectively one-shot style adventure there in the core rulebook. However, at the 30 euro tier, you get the core rule book, but you also get a starter adventure for a party of players from levels 1 to 5. Now, there's already a starter adventure on my Itch.io page called Trouble in the North, a really fun um, starter adventure, which I published a few years ago. It's really great. I play tested it quite well. Um, and it is also for a party of players from levels 1 to 5 set in Yorkshire in the north of England. But for the Kickstarter specifically, as I said, at the 30 euro tier, you get the core rule book and a new starter adventure for you for it to start you literally will be able to immediately start your own little mini campaign and then continue on from there and then of course at the 40 euro tier you get all the digital rewards plus the physical hardback copy of the book and a gm screen mm -hmm. and so yeah i mean i've tried to make it a a, a good kickstarter with a range of tiers at affordable prices for people mm -hmm. and that that is certainly something i can get behind now, with that with that said, I what do we, what would you be shooting for as far as a page count as a whole? I know the Explorer's Guide is about two hundred and fifty six pages, but that may change once, um, once a bit I, more I, artists. Yeah, I, I I reckon the final page count will probably be closer to three hundred. So it's a de it's like it's a big book, you know. It is. It's not the biggest book out there. But it is a lot bigger than a lot of other core rule books out there. But it'll be closer to, probably closer to 300. I'd say 280 to 300 will be the final page count of the book, okay? Because there is a lot in it. As I said, you've got a full system with player's handbook, um, lo um, lore for the setting itself, and then the full zoological compendium as well. So mm -hmm. it'll be coming closer to 300 Um pages by the end of it and then of course when you start putting in artwork and all that takes up physical space on a page which then extends your page count too yeah and while that while that is a lot when you're introducing a lot of new concepts it's definitely necessary mm -hmm. um, but also let's let's not forget that um on the kickstarter that's a 300 page core rule book retailing at 40 euros which is a damned good price. When you look at the cost of a lot of core rule books for other systems, you're often talking 50 plus US dollars. So 40 euros, I think, is a, a pretty good deal for a single book that is everything you need to play in a new system. Yeah. And I, and if it, if anyone says that's too many pages, I will probably throw throw the core rule books for hero system at them and, t and say this, tell me that again. <laughs> well, hold on. Let's just talk about like the single biggest TTRPG system out there, the Dragon Game. Okay, Dungeons and Dragons. Whatever edition you play, it doesn't matter. But even with the most with the most recent fifth edition, if you you are supposed to buy three books, each one is about two hundred odd pages at fifty dollars each. You know, mm -hmm. so like the biggest, most popular TTRPG out there is costing you $150 for and it's 600 odd pages. So I think I think I think um 300 pages for 40 euros is a damned good deal for a person. Which you know you know what's funny? Uh -huh. The edition that everyone tells me I'm supposed to hate, but I don't because I'm not getting paid. Um 4th edition. Mm -hmm. I was able to get a I was able to get the the core 3 books in a set mm -hmm. uh -huh. shortly after it released for about 65 us well that's incredible yeah i've never played fourth edition i'd really love to a friend of mine played it years ago and he basically they gave me all their books i've got like about like i don't know like eight ten fourth edition books and i'd really love to play it because i know a lot of people hate it it's like marmite you love it or you hate it but from what little i've heard about it it seemed to have incredible mechanics that weren't in any of the previous editions and are not in 5e either and like as a gm and as a as a game designer and as a creator and a writer i'd really love to play it just to get a feel for those mechanics yeah and i oh the mechanics that it has there it there is a precedent for them it's just not the precedent that people thought that people thought a lot a lot of people I've I've stated had this kind of Dana Carvey effect where they 
um, that where they stop they stop criticizing the game itself and instead we're criticizing a impression of an impression of an impression of what they thought it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, especially the MMO complaint because I did I didn't forget that people that in 2000 I was seeing that I was seeing people remark that D and D was being turned into Diablo. So, mm. so it's one it's one of those things that I constantly take the piss out of because because of how ridiculous it is. Like yeah, yeah. like there's this ironclad rule that as designers we're not supposed to be taking inspiration from certain things if we're doing fantasy. Or... That's ridiculous. Every look, all, everything is derivative. Yeah, and or... and within the fantasy genre, everything is a rip off of Tolkien. And there's like I don't care what anybody tries to say. In the fantasy genre specifically, everybody is ripping off J O or Tolkien. Which I'm per I'm I've got no I've got nothing wrong I've got no issue with with that. Oh. No, nor do I. He was he was brilliant. Like, why wouldn't you rip him off? He was a genius. Oh. You know, the guy created a bloody entire language because he liked Finnish and thought elves from Norse mythology were cool. Yeah, but I I I got myself I got myself in a bit of trouble for the audacity of 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 pondering whether whether or not we are whether or not people are. Keeping, keeping, say, cyberpunk too much in 1980s futurism. Oh yeah, no, that's a valid point, you know. And cyberpunk's a very complex genre itself because there's a lot of different themes that you find in cyberpunk. Mm -hmm. You know, you got humanism, you got transgenderism, you got a whole bunch of things in there. And if you want to keep it in a rigid 1980s esque sci-fi dystopian Blade Runner type of world, you're really hobbling what you can do in a system like that. Yeah, and I I don't have any problem with people who take that route. What I always had a problem with is the idea that that's what you have to do. Yeah, that's exactly like if that's the game you're playing, great. But that's not the only thing Cyberpunk is, you know. I and I just and just as a a case in point, um, I've I've let's look, let's look at the whole that whole late stage capitalist dystopia as mm -hmm. one as one example. Um, I have had a, now. I've never gotten full confirmation of this, but I've always had a feeling that the reason why that became so prevalent is because of the corporate raider problem in the bit in the business world in the 1980s. Yeah, and there and there's been th there's been things in the te in the tech world and in the business world that um that that sort of 80s futurism couldn't really account for. So, mm. You know, think things like startups, things like the dot com bubble, things things like um, even even some even something as ridiculous as crypto. I could I I could see a author take taking that and and doing their own spin with it. As much as I don't like as much as I don't like crypto, the mm. it's for it's fertile ground to be explored. But that but it's a case of the the um, and you you pro you probably espoused this on on your own time. That the idea of having some sort of Bible about what you're supposed to do with storytelling in a given genre is leads to leads to more limitations than any sort than the intended quality control that people espouse. Mm. Well, I mean, at its core, what I've done with Fey Earth is not it's not even reinterpret because it's not a reinterpretation. I've gone back to the original interpretation i would argue which is a a big thing to say of folklore because ultimately what makes my game different to other games isn't the fact that it's set in a 19th century earth as opposed to a a pseudo medieval european-esque world it's the fact that all of the fey that exist in fair um with literally one or two exceptions there's like I can count on one finger the number of creatures I completely made up that are not based on folklore, and that was for game design reasons. But essentially, all of the Fae within Fae Earth appear as they were described in the original stories of old, as they were described in the folklore that our European ancestors grew up telling each other around the hearthfire in their homes. 
And so you get these creatures with names that everybody has heard of. Hobgoblin, Goblin, Cobalt, Elf, and so forth. That are completely different to what people think of when they hear those names. Because how they appear in my world is how they appeared in the original stories being told in our world. And the reality is that how these names appear when being used for creatures in popular culture, in popular media, is usually completely different to and worlds apart from how these creatures appeared, were thought of, and treated in their original stories. But with that said, I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how Fey Earth develops. And mm. I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. No, it's great. I, look, I always love a chance to talk about my game. <laughs> and anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say mm. around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody!